Uh, so hi everybody, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. It is 12.30, so uh, just after noon here in Toronto. Um, and so I hope that everybody is well wherever you are in the globe. Uh, my name is Adrian Ludwin. I work at Google Waterloo, which is uh, about an hour outside of Toronto here in Canada. Uh, and I've been on the Kubernetes team for about a year, a year and a half or so. Uh, so I just wanted to spend some time talking about Hierarchical Cool Namespaces, which is a project that we've been working on. Um, oh, sorry, just realized my video was off. Uh, this is a project that we've been working on in Waterloo, uh, primarily, and also in the open source community. Um, so because this is largely an open source project, it has been, uh, I just wanted to talk about who we're working with. This has all been done under the auspices of the Multi-Tenancy Working Group, or WG Multi-Tenancy. Uh, it was formed to both categorize and also solve multi-tenancy problems in the Kubernetes ecosystems. Now, working groups are generally supposed to sort of come together, make some recommendations, and disband. But it turns out that multi-tenancy is hard, and so we've actually been around for a little while. If you want to come join us, we meet every two weeks. Uh, not this week, but next week, Tuesday. Um, and so at that link, there are lots of places, uh, there's lots of information about how to get in touch with us. Um, and, or of course, we're, we're easy to look up on your favorite search engine. So I'm going to talk about a couple of topics today. First of all, I'm going to talk about namespaces themselves. If you use Kubernetes, you probably use namespaces. Well, you definitely use namespaces, but you might not think about it. But there's a little bit more to them than meets the eye. Then I'll give a little slideware demo. Uh, about uh, how hierarchical namespaces work, uh, and then we can uh, all save hopefully a bunch of time for questions and next steps. So namespaces. Uh, namespaces are the primary unit of tenancy in Kubernetes, and what that means is that there are lots of different definitions of what a tenant is. Uh, every company, every organization will have their own definition, but namespaces are a building block to sort of bring all of those together without having to worry too much about what every individual company wants. Now, on their own, kind of like the sort of bare walls in an apartment, they don't really do much um, except organize other objects. So for example, um, you can't have two objects of the same name in the same namespace. If they're different namespaces, you can. Um, but as it turns out, on their own, even though they don't do much, all kinds of other policy objects uh, use them by default or sometimes require them. So let's talk about the ones that require them. Um, if you have service accounts, or if you have secrets that your applications have access to, those are freely available to each and every workload in a given namespace. Uh, so what that means is that if I can start a pod in a namespace, and there are two service accounts in that namespace, one that has high privileges and one that has low privileges, there's nothing that stops me from having starting it on the high privilege one. So what that means is that let's say that you've got different teams, some of which run you know, fairly safe uh, um, workloads and others which run very sensitive workloads. You're going to want to put them in different namespaces, because otherwise, anybody who can start something in one namespace can have access to everything that's in there, uh, both the, the secrets and the, the service accounts. Uh, you can try to kind of whittle this down using a custom policy. Controllers such as Gatekeeper is a good way that you could try to do this, but this is the default, is what Kubernetes gives you. Um, now, I should note at this point that while namespaces provide isolation in the control plane, which is stuff that you get, you get by typing kubectl, it doesn't do anything at all about the data plane. So even if those two teams were safely segregated on the control plane level, if one of them had a malicious workload that was able to break out of the container and attack other stuff on the, um, on the cluster, then namespaces aren't going to help you at all. <clears throat> there's, there's nothing you can help do. For that, you need techniques like sandboxing, something like GVisor or CATA containers uh, to help defend the, the data plane. That's out of scope of this meeting, uh, this talk, I should say. Now, there are other features that even though they don't really require namespaces as such, they provide a lot of the, their best support for namespaces. Um, so RBAC, for example. RBAC, you can actually, if you threw everything into one big namespace, uh, you could use RBAC in many ways to, to control access to different objects if they already exist. Uh, if you want to scope creation, then that can only be done at, uh, at the namespace level. But if you only have one namespace, that wouldn't matter. Um, but they definitely work best on the namespace level. <clears throat> so this user has permission to 
view secrets in this namespace uh, is an example of the way RBAC is designed to be used and the way it works best. Uh, lots of other policy objects uh, apply to this as well. Resource quotas, limit ranges uh, can apply within a namespace. Uh, network policies, again, use namespace defaults by, uh, use namespace boundaries by default, um, although they also have some other requirements such as labels. Um, <clears throat> it's probably a good point here to, to talk about why you don't use labels to organize instead of namespaces. Um, labels are not secure. Anyone who can edit an object can add any label to it. So if you say, for example, let's say I wanted to apply some kind of policy to a bunch of objects with the label highly secure. Um, anybody who could any, edit any other object could just go add that label. So in general, labels are a bad way to organize your objects, whereas namespaces are a much safer way to organize your objects. Now, that's great as long as everything you want to do sits inside a single namespace. Uh, if you want to start looking across namespaces, well, then you start running into trouble. So you're going to need some kind of source of truth that's outside of Kubernetes, like a Git repo, and you're going to need some kind of tool to get, that, uh, to get those policies from outside uh, the repo into the repo. Uh, and you're probably going to, in many cases, you're going to want to do this anyway. Um, but it means that everyone's going to have their own way of doing it. So some examples you can use for tools like this include uh, Flux. If you're using GKE, you can use something like Config Sync or maybe Anthos Config Management if you're on the Anthos platform. Um, now, there are other alternatives um, that, add, that try to add some kind of higher level concept of tenancy to Kubernetes. Um, so for example, Kiosk is uh, one project that does that. I recently learned about um, Another one whose name, oh, Capsule, is another project that's quite similar. It, uh, OpenShift projects can be seen as an example of this, or the Tenancy RD, which is also run by the Multi-Tenancy Working Group. What all of these do is they try to, is that they add some kind of concept of tenancy above namespaces. Um, now, the reason we started this project of hierarchical namespaces is because we felt there was a need for a solution that was fully Kubernetes native. Uh, so it didn't depend on Git, for example. It will work with Git, uh, but it doesn't require it. And that extends existing concepts instead of adding new ones. So that's what hierarchical namespaces are. They just add a small concept of ownership, which is to say that one namespace can own another. And once that happens, you can do a couple of things. First of all, proper, uh, policy objects get propagated uh, from parents to children. I should say prop, uh, copied is, the, is how that's actually achieved. And you can also delegate some things. For example, you can say, I'd like this person to be able to create a sub-namespace of another namespace, which is not usually something that you can do in Kubernetes because creating a namespace is a very powerful operation because namespaces have so many policy implications. Uh, and this project is provided by an extension to Kubernetes. It's not built in. It's called the uh, Hierarchical Namespace Controller. And you can look it up after this meeting. Uh, what do hierarchical namespaces do? Uh, they're entirely Kubernetes native. They're compatible with GitOps tools like Flux or, or Atlas Config Management. They're built on regular Kate's namespaces, but they have uh, delegated creation, uh, cascading policies, trusted labels. I'll, dis I'll uh, talk about that in a moment. Um, even though I said labels were not trusted, uh, HNC has a way to take some of those labels and actually make them trusted. And it's also easy to extend and integrate. And I'm not going to go into all of this in the rest of the couple of minutes I'm going to talk today, but I've got a session coming up on Wednesday on hierarchical namespaces, and please come uh, join me there if you want to hear more. So this is going to be just a very quick demo, library demo, of what it looks like in, uh, in practice. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn on uh, hierarchical namespaces. Now, I'm using uh, GKE, so in my case, I can actually turn it on through config sync. I can edit the operator object. I can turn on a feature called hierarchy controller, um, and um, and then it's enabled. Somebody is asking, is there a sign up to the Wednesday meeting? That's part of the regular uh, KubeCon EU. Uh, so if you are registered for KubeCon EU, uh, just go look for my easiest thing is to look for my last name, Ludwin, L-E-D-W-I-N, and you'll find my talk, and you can register for it there. Welcome. Uh, so yeah, so uh, hierarchical namespaces are a part of GKE config sync, so I just enabled them there. If you're not using GKE, uh, you can install it from GitHub. So now I'm just going to create a couple of namespaces. I'm going to create a parent and a child. And using the HNS plugin, that's the hierarchical namespace plugin, uh, I'm going to set 
a property of normal child, and I'm going to say that its parent is, you know, uh, its parent is normal parent. And so that's just a one line uh, change that I can make. I can then look at the hierarchy by using the tree command. Uh, and you can see the tree command looks a little bit like the list namespace commands, but with a difference. You can see that normal child is now shown as a child of normal parent. Uh, now, what does this actually mean? Well, I mentioned propagating policies. So let's go ahead and create a, an RBAC role called parent SRE, and we're going to create it in the parent namespace. Uh, so it's got a couple of permissions, uh, and now we've created that in parent SRE. Now, usually, if you then went and asked to see all of the roles in, for example, the child, you wouldn't see the object we just created in the parent because they're in different namespaces. But with HHC, uh, we actually get right away, you can see this object has been created in normal child. Uh, what it does have is it has a label that points back to the parent you know, called inherited from. And this label is what HNC uses to keep track of which objects are uh, source objects and which ones are propagated objects. So for example, if you change the parent of, this, uh, of the child namespace, it would recognize, oh, that's not a parent anymore. I need to delete this object. And so everything gets, uh, gets synced right away. Um, I also mentioned that uh, you can delegate the creation of namespaces. So here I'm going to use um, a different command. Instead of creating the namespace and then assigning its parent, I'm going to use the hierarchical namespace plugin to create a child that's called subchild instead of normal child. And what this means is that uh, I actually don't need cluster level permissions. I only need permissions to create a certain type of object called a sub namespace anchor that goes into the parent namespace. And so I can hit enter, and now that's created. And if I now look at the tree again, I'm just looking at the tree of one namespace right now, you can see that the child uh, that I created via this plugin and the child that I created uh, normally uh, both show up together. Now, one thing I should mention here is that uh, this sub namespace is a real Kubernetes namespace, which means it must have a name that is unique across the cluster. Uh, as I mentioned before, hierarchical namespaces are namespaces, and so they include all of the restrictions. We couldn't magically make that go away with an extension. Um, but other than that, uh, that's less of a restriction in practice than you might think, especially if you put in a policy of, let's say, prefixing the namespace names without a parent. Uh, Let's just have one quick last look at that namespace that we've created. So now I'm going to actually describe the namespace itself. Um, and what we see is there's a couple of slightly weird looking labels on it um, that we call tree labels because they all have the word tree in them. So you've got normal parent.tree depth equals one and sub child.tree, which is the one we're in, depth equals zero. These labels are created by HMC, and they are, and you are you are not allowed to use them. So you can actually trust that these labels will always reflect the hierarchy of your namespaces. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to do things like create network policies that select a tree of namespaces. So for example, you could say within this team, uh, any uh, service is allowed to talk to any other service just based on the on the hierarchy if that team managed multiple namespaces. Uh, this also adds a lot of other extension points. You could write other kinds. Uh, so for example, there's something called the namespace configuration operator, which will copy default objects into namespaces with various labels. You could use that to apply defaults to the labels here. You can also write extensions. Um, and in my session on, on Wednesday, I'll show one of those extensions that just works on GKE uh, that, for example, copies these labels down to the pods because the pod labels can be ingested in ways that namespace labels are not. So this is a very powerful extension mechanism, um, and it's already actually been adopted by other parts of, uh, of config sync inside of GKE. So next steps, uh, I'll go through this briefly to leave some time for questions. Uh, how do you get this thing? Uh, you need a cluster that is version 115 or later. Hopefully you have that. Uh, for OSS, uh, you can go on to GitHub. You can find us quite easily through by, by searching for hierarchical namespace controller, and it's a, a fairly quick operation to uh, install it. And if you're using GKE Anthos, you can uh, you can follow the directions uh, that I just showed you. Uh, there are directions to that from the website as well. Um, as more vendors add this, if more vendors add this, we will add instructions there as well. We are looking for contributors. If you're interested in trying out, uh, so in, in getting started with a bit of Go programming on some uh, 
uh, Kubernetes projects, we want to add some features such as exceptions, which allow certain policies to be overridden, uh, create, sorry, is somebody asking a question? No. Um, we want to do per subtree configuration. Uh, there's a bunch of configuration options that are currently only cluster-wide. We want to limit that. Uh, namespace CRDs are a, are a fun idea that we're kicking around uh, to see if there's some way to accomplish that uh, without going back and re-architecting Kubernetes, of course. Uh, hierarchical resource quota, uh, having one resource quota that applies to retrieve namespaces, not just one. Uh, and improved productionization is always good. So for example, we have some Prometheus support we'd like a little bit more. Uh, plus, testing documentation help is always welcome as well. If you want to come join us, as I said, please visit Kubernetes SIGs uh, slash multi-tenancy on GitHub. Uh, and there are instructions there for how you can join us. There are the other projects that, uh, that the team works on, as well as how to come join our bi-weekly meetings, again, starting next Tuesday, so a week tomorrow. And that's it. Uh, I have, uh, we should have about uh, just under 10 minutes for questions. And so if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, I wanted to encourage everybody to, um, yeah, to unmute yourself and ask questions or otherwise uh, enter them in the chat. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Syed. I had a question. Is there any other approach to multi-tenancy uh, besides this hierarchical namespacing? Uh, like, is there any other competing project? Well, competing is a strong word. There's a lot of alternatives. Um, hierarchical namespaces are great for what we sometimes call soft multi-tenancy, which is to say cases where there's a reasonable amount of trust between people, different people uh, on, uh, on the cluster. So for example, um, I mentioned a project called Virtual Clusters. Virtual Clusters is much more of a hard multi-tenancy uh, alternative, and that's being, uh, can we get a link to the slides? Uh, yeah, we'll publish that later. Um, Virtual Clusters is a, is a much harder idea where basically you actually run uh, Kubernetes API servers as workloads on your cluster and those servers have access to run workloads on the pool of shared nodes. So this is a much harder level of multi-tenancy. It has a higher cost in terms of both complexity and resource usage. Um, but if you, but it can work very well if, for example, uh, spinning up new clusters is difficult in your environment, such as your your on-prem or something like that. Um, there are, as I mentioned, other things such as the tenant CRD uh, kiosk and capsule. Um, which have a kind of higher level, more opinionated view of the world, but they have their own limitations. They're not really designed, well, the tenant CRD is not particularly designed for extensibility. Kiosk and Capsule, I only discovered recently. I think, so, I think Capsule was only recently announced. And uh, they're actually going to, one of the writers of Capsule is going to be joining our meeting, I hope, uh, next week uh, to start discussing it with us. In many cases, those, from what I can tell, could be built on top of hierarchical namespaces. So I wouldn't say that it's competing, uh, but it's uh, it's at a different level of the stack, and they come with their own drawbacks. Uh, and we're looking at ways to sort of better integrate them all so that they all work together. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. No problem. Anything else before we go on? Do RBAC know about hierarchical namespace? No, RBAC is a core feature of Kubernetes, and nothing in Kubernetes itself knows natively about hierarchical namespace. However, uh, HNC, by default, propagates all uh, RBAC roles and role bindings. And what I mean by propagate is it copies them from the parent to the child. What this means is that if you have permissions in a parent, you will have those same permissions in the child as well. And there are a bunch of other features about uh, constraining who can change, uh, like who can modify the hierarchy based on your RBAC permissions as well. Uh, so as a result, the two of them do work very well together. There are a couple of slightly rough edges. So for example, um, it is actually possible using cluster role bindings uh, and cluster roles to 
constraint to, to give somebody permissions to a single namespace, HNC will not do anything with those. It only knows about roles and role bindings. Although I should mention, you can make a role binding to a cluster role, and that works fine. So most of the time, if you use RBAC in the way it was intended, uh, it actually does all work out very well. But uh, RBAC itself does not have any special knowledge about HNC. It doesn't need to. It was designed uh, to be, uh, agency was designed so that the underlying policy objects didn't need to know about. So, answer your question? Yeah, thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. Thanks. I'll answer a couple of questions. Uh, Maria told me when we're out of time, but uh, I'm going to start going through the chats. Is Ingress also affected? Can Is cross namespace Ingress out of the box now, or at least parent child? That's funny. We, uh, so, I made a blog post about HNC on uh, Friday. Actually, that's a good point. If you go to the official Kubernetes blog, uh, we're currently the most recent blog post. And so you can read all about this and get all those same links there. And this is one of the questions I got fairly early on. So no, Ingress, as it is, does not currently, is not aware, as I said, of hierarchical namespaces. Now, there is a technique that you can use to simulate cross namespace Ingress, which is to use external names in a, a headless service. Um, I haven't looked into that much myself, but that is the kind of thing we could consider automating so that if you did put an ingress into then, a root directory, then it could like be... the USB? <laughs> if you did put uh, an ingress into a root namespace, uh, maybe we could make it so that any child services got propagated as external namespaces back up to the top. So that's the kind of thing we could look at. I don't know if I would want to put that in the core controller, but it's certainly an extension that would be relatively easy to build based off of the labels and, and stuff like that. Um, yes, somebody has uh, inserted a po uh, link to the post in the chat, uh, so that is great. Oh, yeah, and Tim Hawken uh, very uh, um, pointed out the thing that I forgot to mention, which is that there are new gateway APIs that are coming on online soon, uh, which will get around this limitation and allow you to uh, access services from multiple namespaces. Up until then, of course, you can also use Istio or another service mesh. Um, let's see. Is there planned integration with OPA, Open Policy Agent? So there's nothing planned right now, although I actually do speak to Max Smythe, who is one of the authors of Gatekeeper, which is the, the Kubernetes integration with OPA. Um, I actually speak to him uh, quite regularly, um, and we have kind of uh, thrown the idea around. Now, as I said, because HMC annotates namespaces with labels, uh, and those labels are certainly um, uh, visible to OPA uh, and, and to Gatekeeper, uh, you can write policies based on hierarchies if you want to today. Now, Gatekeeper does not yet support namespaced policies. Any policy on Gatekeeper is cluster-wide. And so probably the first step um, Either the first step towards moving towards hierarchical policies, policies that only that are designed to only be applied within a tree uh, and delegate the creation of those. The first step of those would be making them namespaced, and then we could make them hierarchically namespaced. But um, I think that uh, Gatekeeper is, of course, an open source project, just like HNC. And if you are interested, I think that they would probably welcome uh, the help of uh, of, create, of, of scoping those things down to, uh, to individual namespaces. It's a non-trivial problem. I know they've kicked the idea around before. There's a bunch of design uh, uh, considerations that need to be worked out, which I cannot remember offhand. Uh, but talk to the, the gatekeeper folks for that one. 